Welcome back, everyone. We will now get started with our poll to poll innovation session. As noted yesterday by the UN representative to Kenya, to achieve the 2030 agenda, we can't rely on philanthropy alone. It is imperative that we activate market-based solutions. Social enterprises have been playing an increasingly important role in that capacity. In particular, tech-based social enterprises, which are raising the bar in terms of innovation on every continent. I'm excited to share that we are showcasing a number of impressive enterprises at Impact Engineer this year. In particular, I'd like to highlight our 2020 ISHO cohort from Kenya, India, and the United States, who are exhibiting their innovation in the Tech Gallery, which is located in our exhibit hall. There are brilliant solutions to ensure equitable energy access, diagnose malaria, enable circular agriculture, and many more. I invite you to visit their booth throughout the event, learn more about their work, message each exhibitor, and even set up meetings during or after Impact Engineered. As a recap, to get to the exhibit hall, please use the navigation on the left-hand side and click on the exhibit hall tab. Our experience with ISHO, ASME's hardware-led social innovation accelerator program, has shown us the significant potential of social enterprise in improving lives and livelihoods in underserved communities. It has also made us keenly aware of the challenges faced by social entrepreneurs. The journey to market for those innovators is arduous to say the least. As our keynote highlighted yesterday, and as we advise many of our entrepreneurs, to succeed, it's important to stick to what we're good at and leverage it accordingly. This is why at ASME, we've been focusing our efforts on advancing hardware-led enterprises and have seen a number of them succeed. Unfortunately, many continue to struggle with reaching scale. Ensuring that social enterprises reach their full potential requires a supportive ecosystem comprised of collaborative actors dedicated to creating shared value. We have been working with a number of such organizations over the years and are thrilled that they are joining us at Impact Engineer this year. Our partnership with Siemens Stiftung is now entering its sixth year and has been one of our most long-standing and meaningful collaborations. We've been members of the Aspen Network of Development Entrepreneurs for nearly the same amount of time and have engaged with the Andean team across multiple continents. And what began as a pilot at the World Bank has matured into a cross-cutting program. These partnerships are the foundation of our work to meet the 2030 agenda, and we're eager to build on our learnings to date. With that, I would like to welcome to the stage Ms. Carola Schwank, who leads the Empowering People Network Program, or EPN, within the Development Cooperation Unit at Siemens Stiftung. Carola will kick us off with an overview of the recently published study on social enterprises as job creators in Africa. Over to you, Carola. The title today raises crucial questions about the impact of social enterprises, their ability to grow their businesses and to create new additional jobs. And we have also to ask how we can help them achieving this all. As a brief impulse, let me share some insights from a recent study that was conducted by Siemens Stiftung and funded by the German government, GIZ. And we published the study in the format of a trilogy consisting of a main report, country profiles and case studies, and you can find all these parts of, on our website. Now, in this study, our objective was to quantify the potential of social enterprises to create employment, and secondly, to define interventions that are needed to exploit the identified potential. We focus on 12 selected countries. They are mainly so-called compact with Africa countries and provided a good regional mix that allowed to make more or less representative findings in our study. You might ask why we focus on social enterprises explicitly and not on SMEs in general. Our answer is because they simply create better jobs, decent jobs, they employ people with poor chances on the labor market, such as young people, women, they usually offer better working conditions, and last not least, they follow a triple bottom line approach by offering not just jobs, but jobs that create social impact as well. 
our approach at a glance. In step one, we used all available data and analyzed the situation in the 12 selected countries. We identified the numbers of SME and extracted a prevalence rate for SE, social enterprises. This rate was influenced by global factors, but also by the results of an ecosystem assessment for each country. Based on these numbers, it was possible to define a number of jobs in 2020 and to make projections for 2030. At the micro level, in step two, we conducted case studies of five enterprises operating in different contexts, different sectors and countries, and looked at promoting and hindering conditions for job creation, in particular in these enterprises. In step four, based on these results, we formulated concrete recommendations on how social enterprises should be supported. And important to mention is that the entire process was attended by expert validation that was extremely helpful and valuable where data lacks have been challenging. And this is the central conclusion of the study. Social enterprises in the 12 selected countries can create a good million new jobs by 2030, as long as they receive the necessary support. The number of direct jobs can then rise from 4.43 to 5.46 million. These assumptions are limited to formal jobs, and given the fact that social enterprises provide additional indirect income opportunities in the informal sector, this number could be even higher. The social enterprises in the case studies show a clear job creation potential at the micro level as well. You can see the, their predicted individual job growth until 2030 within the decade in this slide. Using all these findings and results from the micro, site, micro studies, a complex growth model has been developed that considers not only the different time horizons, but also the different development stages of the social enterprises. The model refers to specific preconditions for positive business development and in the end provided a good framework for the formulation of the recommendations. Important to note that we distinguish between interventions that promote enterprise growth in general and measures that target on job creation and job growth in particular. Yeah, finally, we came up with a series of recommendations that is clustered into financial support, technical support, envi in enabling environment, and last but not least, data landscape has been a topic as well. You can find all these detailed recommendations in the report online. So let me highlight only a very small selection in very brief. Access to finance is extremely challenging for social enterprises in the so-called missing middle. We all know that. So it's not surprising to see a range of recommendations around debt, equity, blended finance, guarantees, collaterals, grants, and further options. In the human resources context, social enterprises could be strengthened through subsidizing stipends for trainees or additional social benefits that ensure decent jobs in the enterprises. Technical support recommendations focus, for example, on assistance in terms of market research and customer focus and partnerships with technology providers are also seen as very valuable. On the job creation level, collaborations with HR firms or management coaching programs are assumed to be good solutions. A well-supporting environment is important for growth. 
directly and indirectly. Several recommendations underline the positive role of lobbying through social enterprise bodies or suggest promoting preferences for social enterprises in public tenders. Specific job portals, the development of appropriate curricula or training schemes could help improve the workforce for social enterprises on a more structural level. And the last set of recommendations focuses on the data landscape. Improvement is absolutely needed here on a generic level, but also on specific questions when it comes to topics such as job quality or inclusion or gender equality, especially in social enterprises. This would, for example, be an appeal to academia or organizations that fund research work. Yeah, so far, the study results in a nutshell. And what's next? The report can def definitely not be the last step in the process. We are aware of the demographic dynamics on the continent, and we see the high need of decent jobs in the African countries. And we have now assessed the huge potential of social enterprises to create such urgently needed decent jobs. Therefore, we should help them exploiting this potential. There is actually no alternative if we aim to provide better conditions and good future perspectives to the people. Concrete projects need to be developed as fast as possible. And I think sessions such as today can provide room to discuss first ideas and concepts. And therefore, let me come to an end with an appeal. Let's join forces and help social enterprises create more and better jobs. Thank you very much, Carola, for the great introduction into the study and into our panel. My name is Leonard Nima. I'm the founder of Studio Nima, and we are very excited that we have been editing partner of the study. And I'm even more excited that we have a great panel today where, as Carola, as you said, we have to discuss all the recommendations, discuss the findings, and define a way forward. For this, I would like to introduce and welcome my speakers and our panelists for today, Elaine Tinsley. Elaine, you're a private sector specialist as, at the World Bank Group. Warm welcome, great to have you with us today. Then, hi Elaine. Then we have Richenda van Leuven. Richenda, you're the executive director at Endy, the Aspen Network of Development Entrepreneurs. Strong expertise in the field of connecting the dots. So this will be exciting to hear from you how you actually do this. Richenda, warm welcome. Then we have Dr. Gerhard Ressel, your deputy head of division at the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development. As Carola just mentioned, being the partner for the study and the, uh, yeah, basically um, you have that special initiative on job creation in Africa. Very excited to hear more about this and how social entrepreneurs actually can play a role in this and create more and better jobs in Africa. Warm welcome, good to have you with us. And last but not least, Patrick Obonio. Patrick, your program manager at IKEA Foundation. Also they are very much involved, especially with a focus on youth employment. So this will be also a very interesting perspective that we are going to discuss. So my panelists, I hope you're all ready for a good discussion. We have heard from Carola, and Carola, of course, you will join the discussion as well. So good to have you on board here as well. As we heard, there are quite a few recommendations, and this will be my starting question to our panel. What are the most important interventions that you see when it comes to job creation potential of social entrepreneurs? And Elaine, I would say we're going to directly start with you. Want to hear your thoughts on this? Thank you, Leonard, and thank you, Carola. Um, we greatly welcome the study for us. It's really important to have more evidence of like the impact that social enterprises can have because this greatly helps our dialogue um, with the government. And I think for us, we see creating an enabling environment as one of the critical issues to helping scale social enterprises. And I think one of the things uh, maybe the study doesn't touch upon is it's not just the jobs that are created in the social enterprises, it's actually the jobs that are created outside of the social enterprises, the indirect jobs. And we can see this as having a great multiplier effect um, because when you create, uh, when you have off-grid vendors who are able to reach out to larger markets, 
This means that there are more smallholder farmers that have access to more pro productive instruments. They're able to generate more income. They're able to send their kids to school. So the multiplier Im impacts on the economy are actually quite substantial. And so if you can even just even just pointing to the number of jobs that can be created in the social enterprise sector is wonderful, but the indirect jobs are even more fantastic. Um, and so the more we can do on creating jobs and creating ties, I think for us, we see the enabling conditions in terms of how do we get the governments to recognize the sector so that they can create the policies and regulations that can support the sector is actually quite critical. I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Blaine. So governments and how to get them involved, I think one fundamental aspect that we're going to discuss today, maybe there over to Gerhard, your point of view, I think would be great. So the government as one important player, what is the role that BMZ could play? What are the most important recommendations and interventions for you? Yeah, thank you, Liu. Um, yeah, my name is Gerhard Russell. I work on the German Development Ministry in a unit called uh, Special Initiative on Training and Job Creation. And our goal is uh, to create uh, 100,000 jobs and uh, 30,000 training places within the next years in our African partner countries. At the moment, we have seven partner countries, a subset of the 12 analyzed countries. And um, I think what, what we add to the traditional instruments uh, of the development ministry is that we want to uh, deal with um, companies as directly as possible. Uh, we want to help them overcome um, investment obstacles and um, we want to develop uh, projects uh, together with them. Um, we have three fields of action. One is focused on uh, European investors in, in, in Africa. One is focused on uh, clusters and industrial zones and parks in Africa. And one is focused on small and medium enterprises in Africa. Um, I think um, most uh, social enterprises um, the study is uh, um, um, focusing on uh, are small and medium enterprises. And uh, we have some examples um, where we um, uh, dealt with um, medium enterprises directly, but it's, it's difficult uh, to get in touch with small enterprises. And uh, this would be one of the most important next steps for us all, I think, um, to get in touch with them. Um, usually we need some kind of intermediaries uh, or similar uh, uh, um, uh, fora uh, to get in touch with them. So thank you. Thank you, Gerd. I would pick up the intermediaries. Richenda, over to you. I think that's a good keyword. What is the role that intermediaries play in this process? And yeah, what can they actually contribute? Thank you very much. And just to explain that as uh, Andy is a network of intermediaries that are providing a range of business and financial support to um, help the small and growing businesses, SGBs as we call them, um, not only have access to capital, but really to be able to grow to their maximum potential. One of the things in, in the report did talk about financing, and certainly that remains an issue. The IFC, the International Finance Corporation, has um, estimated that there's still an annual financing gap of around $136 billion a year for African SMEs. So, you know, there's still work to do on that front. But I would also say that we need to go deeper than that and actually look at the overall ecosystem. And we've been working for the last several years um, with the support of the German government now as well on a global accelerator learning initiative, looking at what's happening in the ecosystem in terms of acceleration support for small and growing businesses. And while it's very encouraging to see that acceleration helps and indeed actually putting a, a, a small business through two acceleration programs can create additionality. Um, so two it can be better than one. We still see that there are some significant gaps. And one of them in particular, I want to just focus on is that there is a gender gap in acceleration. Um, that actually gets widened often through acceleration programs, meaning that a woman led business will come out of acceleration further behind than a male led business. And we've also seen that um, women led enterprises, while they can get access to debt, um, often do not get the access to equity that they need to grow the businesses. So in order for the SGBs to ful fulfill their best potential the social enterprises to be the maximum job creators, they also need to have that equitable ac access. Um, and certainly we're focusing on, um, on the gender component as well as other aspects there. Thank you very much, Richard. Very, very important point, very specific point also when it comes to that gender gap in finance. 
Financing in general, we all know this has been a massive problem. You mentioned how big the gap actually is, and we're always talking about the missing middle. Patrick, over to you. How do you perceive this funding gap? And maybe there directly a follow-up question. Do you think we need to have more specific funding, let's say focusing on job creation in particular, on closing the gender gap, on creating youth employment, so that funding itself by quantity is a gap, but that it needs to be more tailored? Thank you so much. So at the, care, at the care Foundation, of course, we are working to create a better future for many children and young people. And we believe that the key to a better future is actually ensuring that the families have a stability, uh, financial stability and a, a healthy planet. We see therefore social entrepreneurship as a great pathway and opportunity where change makers can actually develop innovative solutions to help tackle these complex challenges. That is why we as a foundation are essentially doubling down on supporting a new generation of greener enterprises uh, that help create jobs for young people and protect the environment and promote economic growth. Because we believe that at this time, climate change is one of the biggest challenges that we face in addition to inequality. And bringing this together to find a solution is um, very important. And then to your question around finance, you know, the green enterprises certainly share a lot of the challenges that um, you know, have been outlined. And the way we approach this at the foundation is actually not only finance, but actually approach from a three-tier perspective. The first tier is really to say, how can we uh, invest in programs that actually help young people to acquire entrepreneurial skills to start and build sustainable enterprises? Because we believe that, as you have outlined in the report, finance is just one piece of it, but the businesses need a lot of technical support services that help them access markets, help them access finance, help them network, and mentorship is certainly an important part of that technical support. And therefore, finance is a small piece of it, technical support is an important piece. The second is to your point around finance. You know, thing we focus on is really growing, as agenda says, small and growing businesses, especially green enterprises that are already out there. And the way we look at this is twofold. Different businesses need different type of financing support to help them grow. As a philanthropy, we really try to understand how can we use our you know, latent capital to invest in a catalytic way that allows business to actually grow and thrive. How can we test new innovative financial instruments that allow them to expand the way the all businesses access finance, especially green enterprise and especially social enterprise. And so I'll, I'll give an, a, a practical example of you know, the work that we are doing with the Kenya Climate Innovation Center, where we are testing an early stage financing mechanism that allows businesses to actually develop and increase their financial cash flow, build their revenues and expand businesses so that they can have a very strong cash flow to allow them access uh, you know, capital in the market. So we believe through this catalytic way of testing different models, whether it's um, uh, fast loss guarantee funds, or whether it's low interest, uh, grant, uh, low interest loans, or whether it's a blended financial tool, we can actually allow, uh, improve the access to finance to a larger piece of, 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 of social enterprises. Maybe one point I would like to pick up there, Patrick, you mentioned the green enterprises. Of course, there's some overlap with social enterprises, but also at some point they are distinct, focusing in different areas. Do you also see a competition for funding in the field? Now, green tech, clean tech, there's certainly a lot of buzz and focus on this. Um, does this come at the expense of other social enterprises in other fields? Uh, maybe Elaine Richender would like to get your thoughts. Elaine, what do you think about this? I, actually, I think while there's some, there's definitely a lot of great overlap between green businesses and social enterprises. Um, they both serve very different markets and different needs. And um, I really think actually the KCIC is a great example of a good intermediary in the roles that it's been able to play and be able to be an advocate for the um, for the green sector and also in being able to provide financing. So it provides a whole slew of services to the green sector. And I think if we can replicate more of these kind of KCIC models and have support for them, this is actually going to be quite helpful in increasing the job creation potential of social enterprises and green enterprises. Um, to me, I don't really see much of a difference between 
social enterprises and green, green enterprises, mainly because I think the green enterprises, their impact is on the environment, but you know they might be more profit oriented, which is perfectly fine as long as their impact is just as, uh, just as strong, right? Um, so I think um, overall, I think it's good that you know we focus on both of them. I don't see the competition for funding as taking one away from the other because I think a lot of impact investors they do look at different sectors. Um, so if there's it, it's a different market for them to to be looking at. So, um, but yeah. Thanks, yeah, thanks. If I can, if I can just add, um, I mean, on the on the green enterprise, it's a it's a broad it's a broad area. Um, I've worked for many years now, sort of been um, overseeing and helping to pioneer the off grid renewable energy sector. Um, and I would say that while that has attracted a lot of funding and a lot of the entrepreneurs who are working in that sector are indeed social entrepreneurs, they're really coming at this from a mission first standpoint. Uh, we are still seeing some challenges um, on financing which is it's still easier to get funded if you are coming in as an international enterprise rather than as a local enterprise. So we're still seeing some systemic issues that need to be addressed um, in that sector. And I would say that that is um, pretty much consistent across many sectors that we're looking at on, on the sort of the broader green enterprise um, um, approach. And I, I just wanna say as well that I think um, I've seen a couple of the questions that have come in around around sort of looking at uh, degrowth. I mean, there's so much potential with green growth. And I think that we have just a, a, a massive, first of all, the, the urgency of climate change, you know, demands that we find uh, more sustainable circular solutions to these challenges. But we have great opportunity to do this. And I think, you know, we've we've really got um, uh, a, a really great um, opportunity to use social entrepreneurship and and green entrepreneurship sort of as as one as one approach um, to really look at building circularity into our systems. You know, looking at how we address waste, looking at how we actually um, address things like agricultural waste, which is a huge issue not only in developing economies but I would say across the world as well. And we can really work with social enterprises to um, to help address many of these issues. And at Andy, we are increasingly um, embracing that and uh, and working across our ecosystem to to, to surface and support these um, green entrepreneurship approaches. Yeah, and you mentioned how they can address all the different issues out there. There are quite a few issues that we're facing nowadays. And Carola, you mentioned it before. Of course, with the study, we have a focus on the job creation potential. But it's not only about creating jobs, it's not only even about creating decent jobs, but decent jobs with impact. So even one step beyond, and that kind of correlates to Regina, what you just said. So how can you then take care of the other problems around? Um, Carola, do you think, and that's also some of the recommendations that we have that we say, financing also needs to go more specific into this direction of creating really jobs and have a focus on job creation. Do you think that is a big potential and a big need? the mute button, Carola. Uh, yeah, in general, I, I can only agree with, uh, with Regenda and, and Patrick. Um, there's a high need on uh, financing and access to finance uh, that is tailored to the needs of uh, the social enterprises uh, in terms of ticket sizes, types or sources of funds. That, that's, that's a huge problem. Uh, on the other side, um, it would be great if um, actors would come together uh, from different um, development fields, such as the public sector, private sector, philanthropic sector, to uh, have a, a, um, a detailed look uh, on the single recommendations and to see how they could fit into their own uh, strategies and approaches. Uh, but um, the same process would uh, definitely be necessary in terms of technical support and, and supportive environments. And that, um, that um, is actually the um, answer to your question because we have a, a range of um, recommendations that focus on um, decent jobs and, and the quality of jobs in the social enterprises and how the social and entrepreneurs could be supported to um, provide such jobs. And uh, there is a, a huge um, demand uh, in terms of yeah, uh, leadership uh, coaching or uh, on, on financing uh, things such as um, 
stipends or, or, or support the curricular uh, development. So I think um, it's, it's not funding, only funding uh, itself, but it's only on also um, funding um, levers that can help enterprises uh, to um, create more and decent job. Absolutely. And maybe now kind of way forward, look into the future, like we all kind of agree about the big potential that is out there and the big need, still it has not been fully utilized yet. So what are the things that can really be done also from your point of view, from your organizational point of view, Carola, you mentioned the public sector. So over to Gerhard, question for you also, the plan for the German ministry for the BMZ, how to integrate social entrepreneurs specifically, where do you see the potential for, for the ministry there? Yeah, it's, uh, as I said in, in, in our initiative, um, the, the first thing is to get in touch with the uh, companies, with the enterprises. And um, so we, we are collaborating in different countries with different, um, uh, say, um, um, agencies that um, support small and medium enterprises, but they don't focus on social enterprises directly. So um, it would be um, a great step forward if we could identify some actors um, that uh, work more closely uh, with these social enterprises and then um, ask them what's, what, what are their individual um, uh, investment obstacles. Um, because of course we, we know it uh, statistically, but we uh, to support them, we have to know it also individually to, to help them uh, um, uh, create jobs. Um, and I would hope that some of you uh, could um, support us um, and, and uh, share your knowledge and <laughs> that we can establish a kind of uh, forum, um, hopefully afterwards. Thank you. So that's a call to action to, to the other panelists. Um, and Patrick, I know we had some good discussions up front where we talked about we have these intermediaries on site, but also the activities of the intermediaries need to be aligned, coordinated and so on. Where do you see the big potential when it comes in this direction? I think there are two things that I want to, you know, echo from 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 Grad's presentation. One is, you know, the ability to recognize social enterprises, uh, you know, legally in a different geographies. Because I think at this time, despite you know the massive contribution to the economy that social enterprises are doing, they're finding it really difficult to operate legally, to operate from a legal standpoint. Uh, governments either classify them as NGOs or for profits or whatever, different. So. Their, their recognition, the unique role that they play in addressing some social, environmental, and economic issues on the ground are not actually, uh, you know, recognized and appreciated by the government, and they are not provided with the enough, you know, policy framework that allows them to thrive. And I think there's a lot that can be done by working with different organizations to actually ensure that we provide social entrepreneurs with, you know, a platform and opportunity. And we see from an example of our work. You know, Reach for Change, for example, has has, has worked with um, uh, the social entrepreneurs in Ethiopia to register a social enterprise association that brings all the social entrepreneurs to help communicate and discuss policy issues, reach out to policymakers, reach out to investors, and to re really create a, you know a conducive environment for the government to recognize them. These are you know basic steps, but I, we have to realize that this has to be driven locally, and we need to promote this. Secondly, uh, the, you know, I already talked about you know innovative financing, but beyond that, I think that social entrepreneurs need array of these um, facilities that we talked about, you know, and you've outlined them very well in your document. You know, access to finance, technical support, an enabling environment, and different organizations that are talking today on the table have unique expertise, and I think we need to rethink of you know this whole idea around intermediaries and think: Can we find an Uber intermediary, you know, let's say like Andy or whoever, who brings other players together, not only intermediaries together, but also is able to facilitate collaboration and communication again, uh, uh, with different players, with impact investors, uh, with philanthropists, with governments, and with the social entrepreneurs themselves. Because I don't think that, you know, finance is an issue. There's more money than we need. It's a question of how do we bring the different people who hold the money together to di direct them to the right uh, you know right players and the right businesses that are going to solve our social and um and economic issue 
And I think we are not in lacking expertise. We have enough expertise, even right now, talking, that can provide technical expertise. It's a question of how do we bring them together and how do we leverage each other's expertise and knowledge and um, capabilities to be able to support social entrepreneurs or green enterprises for that matter to thrive and create more employment opportunities. So I think this thinking process of, you know, getting sort of an Uber platform, you know, platform economy is a nice thing here, but Uber intermediary is really something that we need to think of, or, you know, and how do we focus our energies on one particular issue and leverage our expertise? Thank you. And, and therefore me, thank you, Patrick. I mean, therefore me, the question is, how can we um, actually make such an umbrella intermediary work? How, how would it happen? Where are the constraints? Why is it not taking place yet? And I think one thing that comes to mind is the legitimacy of such an intermediary, who is doing the job. So maybe Richenda, over to you. How do you see the role? Because that's something that you're kind of already doing, of course, with Andy, but having this umbrella intermediary, the need for this. Yeah, I think, I mean, Andy, Andy is already, you know, an intermediary of intermediaries or, or a network of intermediaries. I mean, that that is our membership and we're very, very much member focused. So, um, you know, it's our members that are on our advisory board. It's our members that are on our steering committees at country level. One thing that we've learned and, you know, we're 11 years old and we've been doing a lot of um, research across the sector as well. And, and certainly very supportive of the conclusions of uh, Carola and, and the Stiftung, um, Siemens Stiftung, uh, their work, it's, it's very consistent with um, a lot of what we've seen at Andy over the years. We also see the need to take an ecosystem approach in an individual country. And that's where, you know, a country like Uganda, for example, that actually has a very supportive startup culture. Um, however, a lot of those businesses are not able to grow to their maximum potential. It's not just because they are lifestyle, um, entrepreneurs and social entrepreneurs particularly they do want to grow they do want to develop but the ecosystem as a whole is not supportive of them so one of the things that we've done is we've done very deep dives in in terms of the landscaping and the mapping like Carola um, and her team have been doing um, on those several uh, countries that she mentioned across Africa and then from that building out what what then needs to happen and so we have an initiative underway in Uganda called the Entrepreneurial Ecosystem Initiative that's really working across the whole of the sector to look at, you know, how is the acceleration working? For whom is the acceleration working? Uh, what are the results? And then also sort of having a research component as well, which is not burdening the social entrepreneurs themselves. So it's not on their balance sheets, but we can look at the dynamics and we can really look at the data of what, what, what approach is more effective than, than another approach. And we're, we're taking that, that work um, you know, in other countries as well, and really partnering, I would say doing radical partnership you know, to, to make with, with, with donors and increasingly really um, with looking at how we can then use that um, and the results and the findings uh, for advocacy purposes, um, both with, uh, the funding community um, and with governments and, and, and other stakeholders as well. So it is happening. It's not happening everywhere yet. And there's certainly still a long way to go. And the aspect of it's happen not happening everywhere yet, I think also Patrick to what you said, there's some experience when it comes to the social enterprise bodies in some countries, Ethiopia, it's kind of working well, other countries, it's not really happening yet. A lot of obstacles working with the government. Also, Elaine, that comes back to your initial statement, fundamentally important, but I can see different levels of speed, how it works with the governments. Um, so what I can sense here is that there, uh, Elaine, you want to add something to this, I guess? That was your... I think actually, I mean, going back to pick up on a point that Patrick made between like having a legal definition between like an NGO versus um, a nonprofit organization. Um, one of the things that, so, so key, I think this goes back to creating that enabling environment and also having um, um, the government recognize the importance of the sector, right? And in order for the government to recognize the importance of the sector, they also need to have the evidence of the sector. That's quite important too. Um, and so the more we can also build up on this evidence, which is I think the fourth point on the recommendations on the data analytics um, is, is quite critical because as the World Bank, when we work, talk to our government and we, if we're trying to get them to put forth um, a change in their, um, 
in their regulatory framework, a change in their legal definitions of what con uh, constitutes a social enterprise. That's it's that's a huge legal burden for them, and they have to know why it's worth it for them to invest their time and energy and resources into that. Um, so this is why it's actually more important, and I think this is something enablers and intermediaries can help with their social enterprises that they're in charge with to help build in those M&E systems that can help capture the data that can then be translated into how effective and important the sector is to the economy and the multiplier effects of it too. And I think going over to also Richenda's point on local financing, I think this is also, also a key thing. We see a lot of like the, what do you call it, expat social enterprises coming in and they do well. They, they manage to raise the money, they're able to expand. But it would be nice also to see it more on the local entrepreneur side, because I think this is where you really get to the grassroots and you're really able to encourage the sector. So I think it's what is it that we can do to improve intermediaries capabilities to support these enterprises to go up the value chain of their products um, and take a look closer look to that to see and especially I think it has to be a per country approach because each country is at very different stages. And you can create that more enabling environment by having more of the evidence for it, more of the um, enabling factors for those enterprises. And then this way we can actually come to the government and ideally my, for me, it's like what I wanna see is governments collaborating more with social enterprises. Um, Cause I see this as a pathway for scaling up and it's a critical pathway because then you can really reduce a lot of the burdens any place where the government is actually in the way of these enterprises from go, um, growing are also where these governments have policies that stop them. So you want something that's more fluid and so that governments recognize that these social enterprises actually they're natural development partners and actually can have a great impact on both social and economic factors. And one thing that it shows, Elaine, I mean, when you mentioned the, the necessity of having good quality data to give governments the justification to get involved, we're a little bit in a hand and egg dilemma as well, because data is scarce, good quality data is scarce, so we need to have more investments in this direction, we need to get academia involved in order to get government involved and so on. I think what made it very clear, and I think this was really great, that also the panel showed here, how the different topics are connected and interconnected with each other. And that is fundamental. You cannot just focus on one part of the interventions, but they go hand in hand. I think this was kind of the perfect example how data and government involvement might be very connected and linked. We're coming to an end of our session. And I think this was a short deep dive into a big topic. Uh, I think we covered quite well the diversity of the different topics. I think one thing that I really sense is the need for the intermediaries and more collaboration and cooperation in the field. So there's a clear call to action to proceed with these kind of activities in order to address these different fields. And I think there's a lot more need to discuss this further and uh, build on this. And with this, I would say thank you very much to all of you. It has been a great pleasure. Uh, as I said, a short session, but uh, let's keep uh, continuing the conversation. And um, yeah, I wish you all um, good luck with the Impact Engineered Conference and uh, have fun with the next session. So thanks, everybody. Thanks, Richenda. Thanks, Elaine. Thanks, Carola. Thanks, Patrick. And thanks, Garrett. <laughs>